Sergeant Victor J. Miller, United States Army, World War II. I interviewed Vic Miller in Chandler, Arizona, March 1st, 2003. It's been almost 20 years, folks. One of the first D-Day Omaha Beach veterans that I interviewed. When I saw Saving Private Ryan in 1997, something shook loose inside of me, and then my focus became D-Day and those landing crafts, the Higgins boats uh, that Andrew Jackson Higgins built from Louisiana during the war. They're called LCVP, Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel. LCVPs went to shore, the Higgins boats. Vic was on one of those. They gave him two vomit bags, and most men used both of those on the way in. The weather was really bad that morning. So Vic was in one of the first waves to hit Omaha Beach, and he tells a great story. He was 82 years old when I interviewed him. He passed away in 2009 at the age of 88. He was a great gardener after the war, just had actually some uh, YouTube channels on gardening. But just, just love the guy. He, uh, he, he, just, he was with the 5th Ranger Battalion out of Tennessee, the 5th and the 2nd Ranger Battalions. Uh, Second Ranger Battalion took Point to Hawk, the cliffs, scaled the cliffs there, just a, a tremendous battle there. I've got veterans that were there. And uh, Vic's bro uh, buddy Vic Fast, whom I featured last week, Vic Fast from Colorado Springs, they both were in the 5th Ranger Battalion. And before that, Vic was in the 78th Infantry Division before he joined the Rangers. He wanted to get in on the big one, and he was in the big one, folks. Um, just an amazing story of the landing on Omaha Beach. And, I'm just so grateful for Victor Miller and all the veterans that landed on Omaha Beach. Just those are the really the, the my first love of all the work that I've been doing. So, but anyways, I want to thank Christopher Mead. Christopher, thank you, sir. I want to salute you. Look into this camera and say thank you for making it possible for others to hear Victor Miller's story today and the tremendous story he tells. I want to thank you for your dedication to our country and to our veterans. And just I'm truly grateful from my heart receive my thanks and uh, I know many people are going to be blessed by this story so thank you. Victor Miller was a machine gun company sergeant of two squads. He carried the base plate. He got the nickname base plate because he carried the base plate of the machine gun. I think it was like 80 pounds on your back. But um, he was also a prisoner of war, captured twice and escaped. Amazing story. This this man was just amazing the things he did and he, he just sits there. They don't make him like this anymore folks. They don't make him like Victor Miller anymore. Just a wonderful man, just what he did uh, in his service to our country, and I'm just so grateful for him. And folks, those of you who have been watching these videos for a while, I would encourage you, highly encourage you to consider becoming a sponsor of one of these videos. You see how this works, you see how this is done. I would love to, to share your name uh, on this channel and just, just give you credit for it, but I need your help. All the interviews are done, like I said, but I need the help. There's, it takes a lot of resources to put these stories together. And uh, I don't monetize my videos. You've heard me say that, no commercials here. If there is, YouTube put it in there. I didn't authorize it, but, um, so I need your help. So would you please consider sponsoring one of these stories? You know who you are. You're the people that comment on my videos a lot. And I just wanna ask you to please consider becoming a sponsor. If you can't do that, I would ask you to please consider donating to this work. This is supported by you, the viewers and listeners. Uh, in the comment section of the video, when you go to comment, which I hope you do, you can choose to donate. In the video description underneath the video, there's a link to sponsor a veteran. And when you click on that link, you'll see a whole bunch of faces of veterans I've interviewed over the years. And you can kind of pick and choose and decide who you would like to sponsor, men and women. From World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Gulf War folks. So. All right, or you can go to LarryCapetto.com and click on Sponsor a Vet. So thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody that is helping me put these stories out. Our young people especially need to hear these stories. History is best learned from those who are there. So, All right, and I invite you to browse my website. I share that with you in the comments section. So I've gone long enough. What is today? Today is Monday, this uh, January 16th, 2023. And uh, I'm just... My heart's full, folks. My heart's full. Got some projects scheduled this year, and um, hopefully we're going to get a, an interview done with me about my work, how I've told the stories of all these veterans over the years. It's called Capturing Courage on Camera, and at the end of this video, I'll put that link so you can watch it, okay? God bless you. Thank you for subscribing to the channel and sharing these videos, and I hope you have a great day.
first I'd like to just kind of start and just introduce yourself. I know who you are and, the, and the, that you're with the Ranger Battalion and that you landed on Omaha Beach on D-Day. Just tell me that information. Well, I'm uh, Victor Miller and I was uh, in the 78th Division and they were looking for volunteers for a Ranger Battalion and I volunteered and so we trained and went overseas and they promised we'd be in on the big one and we were. And um, so we went in on Omaha Beach on D-Day and uh, did what was necessary there. At least it came out successfully. Victor, I want you to kind of, I'm going to kind of go back a little bit to uh, before you landed on the beach and whatever you can remember. I, I think you mentioned that you were up at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, just tell me a little bit about how the men were feeling, what you were doing, what you were thinking and getting ready to go do. Well, this was it. I mean, we're now on the ship. We've been briefed. They had us in a briefing area with guards walking around to shoot us. We tried to get out because we now knew where we were going. We'd seen scale models of all the houses along the, um, the, the little villages and the houses, exact houses along the coast. We hopefully knew where we were going. And um, anyway, we got on the ship then and we're, uh, <laughs> this is it finally, and we got up quite early, I, I suppose around 2 a.m., and um, this, uh, okay, we're on this British ship, uh, our battalion's on two ships, uh, half of us on one and half on the other. And uh, this is the time to go, and we got up, I suppose, about 2 o'clock, um, quite early anyway. And they gave us a good breakfast that morning, fried eggs and things like that we might never see again. I guess they figured we might never see them again. <laughs> Some of us probably thought the same thing. <laughs> but anyway, we had a good breakfast, got all of our gear ready, and uh, then it's about time to load. Now, the landing craft assault are up along the decks of the ship. They're um, up there. And they had told us that they were going to lower them into the water. So, and then we would climb down these rat lines. Of course, we were carrying a lot of weight that day too. And um, that's what we'd been told. But fortunately, they had us just load over the railing into the sh boats and then lowered them with their divots down into the ocean. And so we got in our boats, we got down and um, cast off from the ship and they kind of uh, got organized by circling there till they got everybody ready and all free and ready to go ashore and uh, we started ashore. Now, it was very rough that day. The waves were pretty big, and um, <laughs> we were jammed in this landing craft. Uh, they had given each of us two vomit bags because <laughs> if you were going to be sick, <laughs> there was no place to go except the neck of the man in front of you because you were jammed there against each other. And so most of the people, I think, used both of their bags before we got ashore. Fortunately, I never was seasick and uh, I didn't have to use mine and I'm glad of that. But uh, anyway, we're going ashore then. I say going ashore. We didn't know where we were going. <laughs> now we had been well briefed and we knew the whole operation supposedly, but uh, what we would, where we would go depends on what happened. Um, I was in the 5th Ranger Battalion, and there were six companies in a battalion. And in the 2nd Ranger Battalion, which was a little senior to the 5th, there were three companies that had been picked out to assault the cliffs on Point de Hoc. That's the most famous operation, uh, climbing the cliffs. Why, we were, why are we climbing the cliffs? Well, there were six... 155 millimeter rifle 
guns up there that could shell out 12 or 15 miles in what they call the transport area. This is where the ships would come in and anchor and then uh, these guns could shell there and sink them. And so they had to be knocked out. We'd seen aerial photographs of the point and the emplacements they had and everything like that. And the three companies of the second were to climb the cliffs. They were to attack at H hour, climb the cliffs, <laughs> knock out the guns in one hour. And if they had taken the point in an hour, then our battalion was to follow in and go in at that point and then go up the cliffs too and do whatever needed to be done in the invasion. However, if they did not take it in an hour, our orders were to go five miles up the coast in the general the Vierville Surmir area and land there. Now, this would be by at H plus one then, one hour after H hour. By that time, the infantry would supposedly have a beachhead and they'd have the, the beach and the hill and the road up on top and we would simply go out of this beachhead and go along the coast uh, five miles and attack this point from the rear. Uh, we had spent a month in Scotland doing just an operation like that, going out every day in March, jumping off in the ocean, kind of cold. And, <laughs> wading ashore and hiking about five miles. We didn't know that was an operation for D-Day, but uh, that's the possibility now. And so we're going in and it's beginning to get light <coughs> and it doesn't look too good. As you see a parachute blowing out the sea, dragging something in the water with it and, and you're getting it closer and closer and then you can see the hills and uh, part of the hills. It's, smoke obscuring a lot of it so you couldn't see too well and we didn't know whether we were going into the point or whether we were going to Vierville and uh, so we kept going and uh, finally we're getting closer and closer and we're beginning to see the beach and it doesn't look very pleasant there the shells are still uh, tracers going along the beach shells landing on it people there uh, it's, um, it's obvious they are not off the beach yet. And um, as we get even closer, then uh, there are big tripods, the steel tripods with the uh, mines hanging on them uh, along there. So if you bump into one of those with your boat, you're <laughs> probably goners. And um, then there are sandbars there and quite a few wounded out on these sandbars screaming for help. and. Uh, well, there's not going to be any help. I mean, you, nothing you can do. You're trying to get landed and uh, hopefully get in there. And um, we're in a British ship. And uh, as we're getting near the beach, uh, I knew the coxswain who was up in the front right corner of this boat, as I recall, he cries out, I'm aground, I'm aground, and he drops the ramp, and the lieutenant jumped out, and the lieutenant disappeared. <laughs> well, I mean, you're only supposed to be in not more than three or some feet of water, so well, they fished him back in, and one of the fellows stuck his tommy gun in his coxswain's ribs and says, I think you'd better get us ashore. And <laughs> we got ashore. Now, of course, as soon as we were out, that boat pulled out and went back to the ship to get out of there. And I don't blame him for wanting to get out of there. However, um, we were, we did get landed. We didn't get more than about knee deep in water. Um, our second uh, boat pulled up alongside of us, uh, the other part of our company, and I was watching them get out. Now, I'm watching all this because as special weapons, we're the... <laughs> Let's say we're behind other people. <laughs> the uh, uh, platoons are in front of us in, uh, as they loaded the boats, and so we're to follow along with our special weapons. And so I'm standing there at the back watching all this, and uh, the other boat unloads, and one of the last ones out was uh, my mortar squad, and uh, had one fellow who was only about five feet high. He was carrying mortar ammunition, 
he jumped out. They were a good waist deep water, a little more. And of course, he was in up on almost his shoulders. And he's standing, he can't even move. And finally, Sergeant Beckyu, who was one of our big strong sergeants, he rushed out there and grabbed him and dragged him ashore. And so they all got out. So we, uh, we made it out. And uh, so now we're here on the beach. And um, good, what do we do now? <laughs> Uh, so then the orders came, well, get down, stay down until we get together and decide what we should be doing now. And so we prostrate ourselves on the rocks there, pretty much. And uh, also watching around, there's uh, down to our right, there's one tank ashore. They'd had a lot of tanks that had built with flotation devices, so they would pull off their landing craft out in the ocean and they could had propellers on them, and these tanks would swim ashore. However, as rough as it was, most of them simply <laughs> sunk to the bottom of the ocean. I don't know how many people were lost there. I never did see any figures. But uh, there was one tank there, and it was all it was doing, running back and forth, and <laughs> people having an awful time keeping out of its way up there off to our right. And um, so we're prostrate there. I'm on the rocks next to our uh, our company clerk, Spurlock, and I looked at him and I said, what is he doing? He's just reaching under himself and pulling out a little rock and laying it on the side, and reaching under and pulling out another rock and laying it on the side. Said, What's he doing? And finally I realized if we're there very long, he's going to make himself a little hole there, lifting rocks out from under himself till he, he gets lower and lower and lower. And uh, anyway, that uh, was going on for some time, and then we got word, okay, it's time for us to take a beachhead. And uh, I think uh, one of the generals came up and told our, from the, one of the divisions, and told our commander then, says, okay, it's up, lead the way, Rangers. <laughs> That's uh, the slogan of the Rangers now, although there's a debate as to what he actually said. That's been argued a lot, but uh, anyway, that's the basis of it. And um, the, I think Sergeant Beckyu again, who had dragged my man out of the ocean <laughs> to save him with his mortar shells, um, he got a Bangalore and put under the uh, had a big uh, concertina of barbed wire there, and he put this long explosive under that, the Bangalore, and blew a gap in that, and uh, so they started through and uh, going up the hill. And um, so we were happy to get off the beach because we, <laughs> it was a lot safer if you got off the beach. Every day, you know, as I say, still shelling it, firing down it, and so on, and uh, we wanted to get off. And um, so up the hill they went through the, uh, there's a path up there, and of course then there's signs all along, Octung Minin, <laughs> Mines. Well, sure, what are you going to do about it? So we kept, of course, we're following other people, in our, and I got up there part way up the hill, and I, Lost one of my squads. I, where's my, I went back down and, what are you doing down here? Oh, they said there were mines up there. <laughs> For, well, forget that. Come on, we've got to get up there. So we went up again and uh, got up on top of the hill finally. I mean, you, I say finally, you, you go up. I saw my first dead German along there. I mean, waxy, yellow, laying there. I, that's probably a dummy. It's probably booby trapped. I mean, that's my first dead one. It wasn't the last one, but it was sure the first one. And uh, anyway, we got up. We finally got to the coast road up there along the top, and uh, we moved across that. And uh, <clears throat> we're in a little ditch there with trees along it. And uh, uh, about that time, our battalion commander came up and was right there alongside of my section there, and the Colonel Schneider. And uh, he's getting reports then. There were supposed to be two companies of the 2nd Battalion supporting us, and I think maybe a platoon had showed up or something like that. And then there was a, a 
a uh, lieutenant from artillery showed up and he was supposed to be support apparently. And the colonel says, oh good, get me some fire right up here. And he says, oh, I'm, so we have one gun ashore, but I'm sorry, sir, but that's too close. We can't fire that close. And so, uh, well, then we set up a mortar and they were um, getting a little counterattack on our uh, front platoons from the, and so we dropped some mortar shells up there and kind of repulsed that. And, and then we uh, started, uh, see, we'd had uh, reports, as I said, coming in there. One boat of F Company had sunk and I had a buddy I joined the Rangers with was an F company and I was worrying about that. And then we got word that all the people had been saved so no one was drowned in that case. It, they just lost the boat. Let's go, I wanna go back for a second, okay. When you guys, it's two o'clock in the morning, you had breakfast, um, were, you thinking, were you thinking about home? I mean, tell me what was going on. <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, People say, well, were you afraid or something? And I never was afraid. Now that sounds <laughs> like false bravado or something like that. And uh, this is, uh, let me put it this way. If you go to a track meet, you see a bunch of fellas get out there on a line and they all get down and they're waiting for the gunshot to come and then they run like the devil. And uh, we had trained. We had bought, we were volunteers. I mean, a lady who wrote uh, Reagan's speech for the 40th anniversary, I think, on Omaha Beach, uh, I'm reading an article of hers later, and she said she wanted to ask men why they would do something like climb the cliffs or something. And my point I'd like to talk with her about is she's asking the wrong question. Why would they join the Rangers? Once you join the Rangers, you made a commitment, <laughs> kind of like I'm going to be a kamikaze pilot or I'm going to be a <laughs> whatever. I'm going to die, most probably, but I'm going to die in the group I can be proud of and doing something that's as good as we can do. And so we went from that standpoint that you're here, you're going to be the best and you're going to do the job and we're just waiting for the job. We trained like the devil. I mean, we worked our butts off and we're looking forward to this invasion and now it's here. And so we're really looking with anticipation rather than dread. It's uh, here, I'm finally going to get to do it and uh, let's get the job done. And so that's uh, kind of a strange way to <laughs> think of it but uh what was the mood like on that assault craft going to shore was it kind of like well, rah rah or was it, was it, was it yeah, i say it, it was rather somber i think mm -hmm. that uh, you, you weren't doing any cheering or anything like that you're just waiting here and uh, you never the chances that you're going to die were pretty good and uh, there's no question of that and, uh, when did you realize you were starting to take artillery or small arms fire? Just when you were just offshore? You're, what did it sound like what was coming in? As you're getting, uh, as I say, it was just getting more and more light as we're getting closer and closer to the uh, beach. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when you were getting concerned then, as you see that uh, things have not gone as they were scripted. And uh, the infantry is still here on the beach and they're being shot up and there's all these wounded and uh, and dead along with them and uh, so we may be taking our turns and fortunately our commander had moved us over a little bit to the left and uh, where he thought it was quieter and we got in there with very few casualties on there but that's <laughs> that was the after effect not to <laughs> Not what we were concerned with as we were going in, which was uh, certainly we could be liquidated in, in mass as we just go in. That's very possible. Now, you were one of the first waves in then that morning. Well, supposedly, you see, we were going in one hour after HR. The infantry landed supposedly an hour before we got there. And uh, 
So we weren't supposed to be the first wave, but because yeah. we had this special job we were supposed to be doing. But uh, it turned out we essentially were uh, the first. Were you in a in a convoy? Were you in a wave of boats coming in? Were you by yourself? Did you notice if any of the boats on either side of you got hit? No, by the time we go went in there, it was just the only ones I really saw was our boat and our other company boat right next to us. Now, as I went up the hill, I was looking back, and I guess I was up on top of the hill, and there was a what I called a landing craft infantry boat came in there. Now this had ramps on each side of it coming down. I was watching this landing craft come in and, I mean, I had never seen these things, but anyway, here, so soldiers are swarming down each side of it in ramps that are, or stairs or something that come down. And suddenly it just disappears in flame. Uh, the story we got later was that somebody was coming down with a, uh, with a uh, flamethrower and some shell came in there and hit that and just uh, went flame all over everything there. And so things like that were happening. And uh, so it's... So now when your ramp came down in your boat and you guys went out, were there was machine gun fire coming across into the boat across the beach or...? There were shell uh, bullets flying along the beach and so we that's why we prostrated ourselves as, on the rock as quickly as we could, uh, uh, just to, the lower the profile, the less apt you are to be getting hit. And so that, um, I say they were still shelling along it and firing along it. And, uh, what, uh, well you guys seem like a, an elite force. There was obviously a purpose in what you were doing, a strong purpose as far as your country and you know, what you were doing there, Hitler. <laughs> Well, that was it. I mean, if, if we were in a war and we were going to be in it until it was settled. And the sooner we could get it settled, the sooner we would get home. And so we were looking forward to getting a victory as quickly as we could. And uh, yes, this was a, a, a pretty tight-knit group. It, uh, uh, a lot of... <laughs> Esprit de corps or something in the Rangers. In fact, I mean, we were so good, we always figured bullets will bounce off of Rangers. I mean, they're tough. <laughs> it didn't tr turn out to be quite true, but uh, the, the morale was, was really... This. We had so intense training and we had the morale and that's where we could uh, succeed uh, much better in, uh, than the typical infantry group who did not have that spatial training and and morale. Now you mentioned when you came in you heard men crying for help and you know you really couldn't do much and I've heard that from others too because you were ordered to just keep moving. Well they were out on the sandbars and the tides whether it's coming in or going I don't know but it was sir they couldn't get ashore and they're wounded and nothing anybody could do for them because you had other things you had to do. Now, when you came out of the boat yourself onto the beach, uh, what, what, what were you seeing at that point? I mean, other men were coming out of the boat too, I'm assuming, and then were there, were there so, wounded soldiers or soldiers being shot as you were coming out of the boat? Or Actually, right where we were, there were not. Uh, down to the right of us, uh, there were quite a few wounded along there. But as I said, our c commander got us in a spot where we were fortunate because of his experience I think and um, so so why, why, why do you ever think about why you made it through I mean, what 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 do you why do you think you made it through <laughs> I mean, a lot of people did sheer luck I mean I've uh, no you never knew uh, as the war went on the old rangers got fewer and fewer. Every time you went into an engagement, you lost a few more. And, and then later you begin to look at each other, well, wait a minute, it's going to be our time before long because uh, you keep, uh, percentage-wise, you've got replacements and they lost, they lost them too, but you always lost a few old rangers along with them. And so you just fewer and fewer were left. 
You knew your time would come sometime. Tell me a little bit more about that landing craft that took you ashore. What do you else do you remember about it? Was it a wood boat, a metal? What was it? It, uh, I think, had a metal uh, armor around it. Um, so it had a rather small, um, let's say the ramp was not very wide. It kind of came to a somewhat of a point in front, and then the ramp would drop down. And the, in other words, uh, is to not more than a couple of people at a time could dash out through that. So it wasn't one that the whole front end dropped down. It was just a, a narrower slit than that to get through. And do you recall if that was a, what they referred to as the O'Higgins boat or was it an LC? <laughs> we just called it a landing, a landing craft assault. And uh, I don't really know. A uh, little bit of reading I've done and I've never really seen pictures of these. Uh, apparently these were the British model of that. And it was apparently rode a little lower and was a little, this, little bit less seaworthy than the American type. And uh, a little better armored on it too. Sure. So, sure. That, and there was the coxswain and then he was uh, the one that steered the boat? He or? was up in the front right as we were going in. And I suppose there were some in back in the back somewhere, but we didn't have anything to do with them. He's the only one we saw. And again, when you, you already told the story once, but when the ramp was lowered, there was an, well, he said, we're a beach, we're a beach. Was there, was there an order like lower the ramp or anything, or just boom, <laughs> you guys are out? Uh, probably... Well, uh, it was, in this case, it was, he just said, I'm a ground, I'm a ground, all out, and he drops the ramp. And that's when the lieutenant jumped out, and <laughs> obviously we were not aground. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, running up there, and there were people all along there. And, yeah. Yeah. and for some reason, it was very congested, and he had to do what he had to do, but that would have been a hard job. So, mm -hmm. but um, I want to ask you another question. This is kind of um, ties up the interview, but I'm, um, I'm asking all the veterans this question, you know. Um, well, I guess, first of all, do you consider yourself a hero? Oh, Lord, no. <laughs> no, I was I was just a special weapons section sergeant following along and doing what <laughs> what we could to support other people. Mm -hmm. What do you, uh, I want you to think about this before you answer, but um, today in our country, what would be your message to the kids today? <laughs> oh. I think my message is that you just have to stand up for those things that you believe in and uh, don't just accept something and if you don't disagree with it then you better speak up and uh, and not only speak up but maybe act up and do something. Now we were kind of carried away if you will with uh, patriotism when our country was attacked and everybody wanted to go in and do something right now. And uh, that kind of waned a little bit too, but uh, um, I think that we just have to do this. I, you mentioned the flag. I, I have to tell another story. I was a prisoner of war for a while and, and then we got word that uh, this prison camp was being liberated and I wasn't sure I couldn't see anything and then I saw the American flag flying on a pole over the little village of Mooseburg. And that was, <laughs> that was the real thrill. There's the American flag. I, we're now, I'm, I'm free again, I'm free. I'm no longer a prisoner. And so uh, being free is a very valuable commodity. And just don't let anyone take your freedoms away from you, be they politicians or other foreign countries. Just fight for it. Well said. I appreciate that. I agree with you. I saw a, there's some billboards around town here. And I'm assuming, you know, that flag represents our freedom, you know. And we're not going to back down from it. And, you know, what you did as a part of a big group effort mm -hmm was um, very, very important and needful at that time. Mm. And did you say you enlisted or were drafted? What did you um, I was uh, 
I was a senior in college in 41, 42, and uh, so I was in the draft, and I, the second draft, and I probably had a winning number, I had about number 17 or something like that. Undoubtedly number one in my, <laughs> almost number one in my county. I mean, I draw thousands of numbers. I was in a small county in Southern Illinois. So I mean, I notified him, look, I'd like to finish college. As soon as I'm through, I'm, I'm ready to go in. I'm not gonna appeal or anything. I want to, I'm ready to go. So as soon as things worked out and we had commencement, and, so on why I I was called and taken to St. Louis and given an exam and you could take I forget ten days, two weeks or something like that if you wanted. I'd already had that at home and after school and so I, I'm ready to go. So I they took me to Scott Field and I was in.